idea that I feel like what it does, it takes this really ambiguous, scary, dark, never-ending hole, for lack of a better term, you know? Um, I don't know what it's like to think about death without knowing it. So, I mean, forgive my assumptions there. But uh, I think it gives an idea of control. It gives an idea of um, compartmentalization. It creates organization. It takes all those scary, messy feelings that we have no idea what we're going to do with and all the uncertainty about, wait, what? I'm going to have to live without my person? And it gives them some sense of control and understanding. Hello and welcome to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. Welcome to today's episode. Today, I have Lindsay Joy, a friend that I met through Instagram. We both happen to have Instagram accounts on the topic of grief, and we connected that way. And I was inspired by her posts and the way that she just shares so vulnerably Uh, her story. And I was eager to learn more about her story. And so I decided to invite her on to the podcast so that as I am learning about her journey, you, the listeners, can listen as well and feel inspired and uh, yeah, yeah, through her journey. So Lindsay, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Kendra. I appreciate it. I am so glad that you accepted <laughs> in this in this like one in shot. Usually I even do pre-interviews before podcasts and today we're like, no, let's just set up the appointment. Let's just go on it. Well, let's do just it. dive like, right in. Let's do yeah. it. Let's just do it. <laughs> but, I kind of love that is, part of sorry. Yeah. No, I, just, ahead, I love ahead. that about this community in the sense of like, um, you said it. I mean, we're already speaking so vulnerably. And so mm-hmm. it's so interesting how, um, that can really take a lot of the discomfort right out of the gates. <laughs> you know, we don't have to worry so about funny. the small talk. We just jump right in. You know what I that mean? That is so, so funny that you say that. It's so true because it's like the first thing I ask right away is like, okay, go ahead. Tell us about your grief experience. It's like usually you talk about people like, and what's the weather like? And how are you doing? And then maybe you get to know the hard parts and, and you know, in most relationships. But you're right. When you've gone through something hard and you already are putting yourself out there in Instagram or Facebook, whatever it is that you uh, expose your vulnerabilities to or podcast, Mm -hmm. then you already um, are basically allowing others to ask you about that hard part of your life. um, Yeah. Right. Right away. Right from the get go or that vulnerable part. So thank you. I I appreciate it. So Lindsay, where where do you live? Right. Where do you live? Does this just start? Let's actually do with the. Let's do a little bit of the chit chat. Let's do a little bit of the, what's the weather like? Let's do that. So Lindsay, (laughs) where where, where are, (laughs) let's just go backwards. So you live, you live in the West coast. I know that we were doing Pacific time, central time. So you're Pacific time. So I am. um I'm on the central coast of California and so I live in a tiny little beach town um just outside of Pismo Beach and mm-hmm. you know it's smack between San Francisco and Los Angeles for anybody who's not familiar we're kind of right on okay, the coast so there. Okay so it's smack there. Okay mm-hmm. and the awesome. weather it's funny you say that um it's always nice here you know I'm very blessed to live here I went to college here and just had enough wits about me to never leave <laughs> when okay. I graduated That's beautiful. and uh, uh, that's, is, is that beautiful. is that near San Luis Obispo? Yes, actually, that's exactly where I went to school. So okay, um, so Polytech. I don't live is in... that what it is? Polytech yes. is that the one that's in? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and um, and so more people are familiar with Pismo Beach, and then I'm just about ten minutes south of there, so I'm just outside okay. of San Luis Obispo. That's uh, yeah. I had, an, I had a great uncle that lived in San Luis Obispo, so that's why I 
I know the area, and I used to live in California. So there we go. We got something in common. But I lived oh, in the yeah. LA area. Yeah. I, well, okay. actually, I lived in northern. I lived north of you, and I lived south of you. So I, so basically, I would cross you anytime I'd have to either. When I lived in northern California, I lived in Gilroy, the garlic capital of oh, the yeah, world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I lived there for a year, and then through yeah, and then in uh, the LA area. So there we go. Cal- it, now, uh, now we know. Now we know. So, um, so now you live in California. You have uh, something unique on on Instagram, and it's that you share um, a little bit about your. Um, it, it's like post traumatic stress, right? That was developed because of the grief experience you had, and that's something that I is that correct? Am I am I saying it correctly? Yes. 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 Um, and so, so more specifically, it's complex, <clears throat> complex PTSD, um, which there's sort of f- a few different ways to look at it. But from my experience personally, it's very much relational trauma. It's very much caused by the rupture of attachment when my mom died. I was an infant. And so she was um, my primary attachment figure. Um, and after that, it was pretty inconsistent and not super reliable in terms of my other caretakers. And so um, for me personally, I experience that traumatic stress much more in my relationships. Wow. So tell, tell us then a little bit about that then. How, how many months old were you and is, is what was the cause of your mom's death? If that's okay for you to share? Yeah, of course. So I was very young. I was only 13 months old and unfortunately my mother was murdered. Um, oh my gosh. when my family was, um, the short version is we were traveling and she had just started it. Excuse me. Let me reverse that. She had just started working at the hospital over the graveyard shift. And so she was going to be lurk- working late one night. And um, my dad's sister had recently moved. And so she said, why don't you take the kids and go visit your sister, see the new house, etc." cetera. Um, and unfortunately when she came home, the house was being robbed and they shot her when she walked in through the door. And so and was, were you the only child? So were you were more than one? You were the youngest? Correct. I am the youngest of three children. And so I was just over a year old. Um, and my siblings, while they were both also children, were much older um, in the way of, how do I say this? I don't mean, I didn't mean that to come off like that they weren't children. My point is my sister yeah, had just turned the- seven. Yeah. And my brother right. had turned nine. So the level of... um just contact with my mother naturally. And then just Mm -hmm. a level of understanding. Certainly there were still children and you can only grasp so much, but we just have a very different experience in the sense of, I don't have any explicit memories of my mother and they do, even though they're Mm -hmm. minimal, they still can, they still can place um, this woman in their lives. You know, they can place the relationship that they had up until a certain point. Whereas for me, it's very vague Uh, to me. I agree with somebody that I don't even know. Um, I feel very much an outsider in that kind of experience in my family because, um, because I just didn't get that opportunity to have any relationship with her. What you just said right there of the grieving somebody that you don't even know, like grieving somebody that you don't even have memories of that. I, I, so I have chills right now because it, that concept for somebody that has not lived it, you know, may not Mm -hmm may not even register. But even in that concept of going into grief, even in other areas that don't have to do about death, we sometimes grieve things that we've idealized or created that then don't end up happening. And we grieve Mm -hmm. that we didn't get them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like certain like, oh, I'm going to get married at such an age, or I'm going to have this many children, or I'm going to have this type of job. And then those things don't happen. And then you get that, you know, the grief or, you know, you know, call it, people call it disappointment or whatever, but it, it but it, or because of the, the expectation that you have, but it's, it's grief too, because it's something you had idealized. That is, um, so tell, tell us then a little bit then about that. So then you were, what your dad then was the primary caretaker after your mom passed then of the three of you? Correct. Um, he did remarry shortly after, um, he remar- remarried twice after, Uh, my mom passed and neither of those were necessarily positive um, relationships or experiences in my life. Um, And so in some ways they exacerbated the situation. Um, But ultimately I I never, 
Um, I never viewed them as attachment figures. That was never really ever a part of our dynamic. Um, I would say that he had additional wives and he also had children, but we never really were a family, if, if you will. Um, and did, so did those wives have children as well, like that, though, that they have children that they brought into the relationship or did your, um, did your dad have other children with these? Um, he did not. Um, okay. the first wife did have two other children. Um, one was much older and then the other one was my age and that was fairly traumatic for me personally. Um, there's just a lot of yucky memories and it just wasn't a positive experience. Um, and then the other one, um, was harmless really she just wasn't interested in in having a family or being a stepmother which is interesting when you marry a man who has three children and he's the sole caretaker um you know what I mean so that's sort of what I mean that they were just very separate um and I think in a lot of ways not only from my experience and obviously being so young but I think I just learned to compartmentalize these different parts of my life very young and just went on with that if you will um and so right away um, my mom had two sisters and one of them was actually very, very, um, involved in helping us, um, in our daily lives up until we moved. So at the time we had lived in San Jose, um, just outside of the Bay area. And so we stayed there until I was six. Um, and so for those first, you know, five years, she was really crucial in terms of really helping, um, just to, you know, run the family, if you will. Um, and then after that, after we moved, we uh, returned to my dad's childhood hometown, um, which was up in the mountains. And it was actually, a that was a positive experience in the sense of, um, in all the ways, honestly. And after that, my sister really stepped in and I would say became my primary caretaker, my attachment figure. And I really looked to That's her right. as my mother figure in most ways. And and she was the she was the one that's seven years older, like or six Correct. years older than you. Yeah. Okay. Now, so at that point, how old were you at that point when she kind of took over that role of mm -hmm. the mother figure to you? Mm -hmm. How old was she, and how old were you? Um, if I would say. Remember. I mean, it probably began before this, but to me, it was really clear after we moved. So I was six, and she was thirteen, so a teenager, um, still way too young. Um, and she really stepped up in the ways of really just being able to take care of herself and pitch in for the family. And, um, and honestly, I, I don't know, I don't know what things would look like if she hadn't been there, oh. uh, you know, so that was What a is big... your relationship with her now? Does it still that, does it still have that dynamic? You know, it's been interesting to navigate. Um, we have mm -hmm. a positive relationship. Um, yes, but I'm just it curious is, but how it transforms as you become yeah. an adult as well, right? And it's your sister, but she's always seen you as that role of caretaker. And then when you don't necessarily need a caretaker anymore, you know, when you yourself are already older, but then this, is, you know, I'm just curious of the dynamics. Yeah. Um, you know, for a long time, you sort of touched on it, right? In and of <laughs> itself. And yet it's almost a reverse of that. Um, mm. I think when I was younger, it was hard. I really felt like, uh, I mean, I, I shared everything with her, um, and yet there was still always this element of never wanting to disappoint her or, um, you know, there was definitely more of like that um, wanting her approval rather than her sistership for a long time. Um, and I think we navigated that pretty well. You know, what was interesting is... Um, is being adults and sort of renegotiating all of that now to be mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. sisters. That's been the <laughs> yeah. part that's actually been more difficult for me probably than it has been for her. Um, mm -hmm. She, I mean, I am married and I have created a family in the sense of my husband and my dog, but we don't have children. Mm -hmm. and, and she has married her high school sweetheart and has two kids and it's very much has built a, a family. And so, um, that's probably been the part that's, you know, a little bit more tricky for us to negotiate now. Um, really trying to, you know, I think when I was younger, I needed to make that transition from um, sort of mother, daughter to sister, sister. And I did that. And then I think that I didn't recognize the gaps that that would leave for me in terms of the mother, daughter dynamic. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I so understand the, because it's, it's also like then at what point then it's because you're still kind of as if you're still missing this piece. You So now if that relationship is going to switch to being now sister, sister, then it's kind of like, wait, but then still now who fits that piece that I've associated as, you know, that mother figure now, exactly. if we're going to have the sisterly relationship now. Exactly. So it's, it's like losing it's your that, mom all over again. Yes. And that yes. Is, um, that Oof. has been nearly impossible to put into words. It's been really, um, it's been really challenging to navigate in ways that I show up for myself compassionately and hold space and grace for, for that baby that in me that of course I feel all of these things. And then also negotiating the part of like, I, of course I want her family to be her priority. Of course I'm indebted to all the ways that she showed up for me, but that doesn't erase the gap that, um, that is now there again, you know? And so that's mm-hmm. probably been um, the, the trickiest part that I wasn't anticipating. I think that we anticipated more of that shift originally, but I don't think that we anticipated this part, or at least I didn't, I should say. No, that is, that is, uh, that is so interesting. And just, you know, going back to even how you said about the, um, the grieving experience of even just the three of you of different ages, you know, seven, nine, and, you know, in 13 months and how you all experienced it differently, not only because of your ages, but the memories that you had associated with the relationships that you might have, you know, already created. Uh, I, I always say this to everybody and the grief is it, it, even if it's the same person and the same relationship you have to that person, it's still very unique to every individual. Yes. And, um, and it's and it's the same in these kind of situations. You know, the dynamics with the um, with the relationships change and shift. And I noticed that type of shift in my in my life when my sister passed away. So mm-hmm. interesting, like similar to kind of how you said of her kind of taking over that role of mother. For me, when my sister passed away, she was two years younger than I was. I was twenty one and she was eighteen. I um, I feel that I ended up kind of. The, the two parts of that, that she kind of, um, uh, what, that I associated with her, which were mm-hmm. the best friend, but also the person that I would fight with, you know what I mean? The, mm-hmm. My confidant mm-hmm. as well. I then had to split between that, those two things between my parents. So then my, that my dynamic with my mom, which used to be more like we were, we would fight more at that time, you know, and I, and she ended up then switching to being that role of confidant. Mm-hmm. And my dad being the one that I would fight with. And I remember like me being 21 and starting to notice these shifts and me even telling them, I'm like, like, I feel, and especially with my dad, dad, I feel like I fight with you because I still need somebody to have that outlet mm-hmm. with that I had with Zorana, you know? So, so it's just, all those things are just so intriguing. I just, that's why I created this podcast because I'm just so curious about all the dynamics and what people navigate in their grief. So now share with us a little bit then what has been that process and what are some of those resources that you've used? And, and I mean, and when would, did you start noticing, or mm-hmm. let's actually, let's back up, like either when did you start noticing those, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the attachment component of mm-hmm. the aspects of it? Um, if you want to share that, when did you start yeah. noticing that? So <clears throat> the attachment piece probably was actually not until much later in life, um, partly due to science in some ways, um, proximity to my education and just, um, and really digging deeper into my particular grief experience. You know, before that, I would say, um, you know, as a child, I don't necessarily have any memories of, um, grief about my mom specifically in the way that I don't have memories of anybody telling me what happened. Um, I just grew up knowing that she wasn't around. Um, I sort of intuited Mm. everything, you know, you sort of absorb your environment. Um, And so it probably wasn't until I was a teenager, maybe eighth grade, um, when I really started to recognize, you know, when you start to have these bigger milestones that you participate in yourself, you know, um, meaning, um, not the kindergartners aren't excited about their kindergarten graduation, but you know what I mean? This idea that you sort of understand what these milestones mean in your life. Um, and not having her there was stark to me. I have this memory of 
they gave us a flower during the ceremony and put on a song and said to go out and see your parents. And, and I remember after hugging my dad, I had to hug my stepmom at the time. And I was like, this is, <laughs> is this really my life? You know, that kind of quality. Um, in the sense of like, you hold no significant space for me. You are not the person that I should be hugging right now. And why the hell have we never talked about this? You know what I mean? <laughs> kind of that until, quality. That is um, interesting. So not until eighth grade that you actually are like, wait, we haven't even talked about this. Concept. That So you, that eighth grade, so you were, what, 13. So you really yeah. never started to have those. That is really interesting. Not in my own family, no. And not at least that I have memories of. Um, my aunt that I mentioned, however, the, the, the hard conversations that I had growing up were always with her. Um, I don't know that the quality of them was necessarily about my mom to begin with. I would say it was more about the circumstances Life. of my dad mm -hmm. and growing up and, mm -hmm. and trying to navigate what it was like to be a motherless daughter. Um, and so I remember how much, you know, and she dealt with her own mental health challenges and was um, it was right on the cusp of, you know, the big codependency era. And, and so I grew up having a lot of these hard conversations with her about that. And really just that I remember her drilling into me, um, this idea that my feelings mattered, right. That it was important mm -hmm. to talk about them. And so, um, I sort of look back on my journey as like stepping stones. Every little bit was just a little bit closer to piecing this all together, if you will. Um, so it's not like I had never broached any of that, but certainly not with my dad and not so much in our family and not to the degree of like, mom should be here, <laughs> mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was really sort of the first, um, moment of like recollection. Yeah. yeah or at least memory my... of that. Whoa. What, what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, through my teens, I really was, um, you know, high functioning and high achieving, but I wouldn't say I was super happy per se. Um, I had some, some long-term solid friendships. Um, but I really was more of kind of a resentful, jaded kind of kid, um, naturally. So, um, and then when I graduated and moved away to college, I always knew that that was probably when I would start unpacking everything, you know, um, my sister not only was, you know, a mother figure for me, but um, were similar in a lot of ways. And so when she had gone to college, that was when she had started therapy, blah, blah, blah. So that was sort mm -hmm. of, I had anticipated that, that I would be able to access that resource, um, through my college campus. And, um, and slowly the short description is it really just started to seep out of me, the sort of like resentment and, um, dissatisfaction with, basically everything is the best way that I can put it. I don't, I mean, I knew that it was related to my mom, but I don't think that I realized that I had a really tumultuous relationship with my father. And, um, that was always the focus of it. You know, it was always sort of overshadowing everything, but yeah. there was probably some resentment probably of even just the fact that it was like on that. What you even said of like, why didn't we even talk about this? Like, so, you know, like why didn't even have these conversations about our emotions? Do you think that there was a little bit of that resentment in that situation? You think when you were an adult that you realized if I would have talked about my feelings, like maybe things would have been different. Did you ever think that? Yeah. And I think there was a piece too of, you know, I think I had articulated there wasn't ever like this child version of, well, your mom went to heaven, you know, but mm -hmm. there was sort of this adult version um, of, of everything, you know what I mean? Sort of like, man, what's the word, like a reckoning, if you almost will, it kind of all, everything about that time of life came out. And, um, you know, as a kid who's trying to absorb all of that and <clears throat> make sense of things. And I think that I just resented everything about it because, um, uh, I would have done everything probably entirely different. And yet, um, you know, I was helpless. I was a kid. And yet there's also this piece now fast forward to who I am now and what I believe about grief and the work that I do. Um, I think there was a piece of being so angry, um, at the way 
that some people held their grief after she was gone. And yet I also can look at my own journey and understand, not understand. Yeah, understand. I can see <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, different I know. angles. Understanding you know it. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can yeah. see different angles. And, and so I think for a long time there was just so much judgment. I was so judgmental because because it gave me a sense of control because I was, you know, the last one to know anything as a kid because I literally was helpless, you know, kind of all of those pieces. It was um, not to keep going back to this word complex or complicated, but just so many different layers. That true. That's, yeah. yeah. It, mm-hmm. And it is complicated. It's complex. And, and, you know, maybe the, was the word maybe you were seeking, was that like maybe empathetic to some extent to maybe the way that everybody else dealt, like now that you know how grief is so complex, as we were talking again, here we go, a complex, we're going to get a dictionary and find yeah, right. synonyms <laughs> for complex. Um, do you think that maybe that empathy as you were an adult of maybe seeing, okay, so they did the best that they could with what they had and they were dealing with their grief in each their own unique ways. And these were just the cards I was dealt because those were the cards they were dealt as well. And that's how they handled it. Is that, do you, do you think that yes. that makes, yeah, it's that understand yes. again, here I use understanding, but it's that empathy towards those around you that, okay, they, they, they just did the best that they could, just like I did too, and that totally. you're still doing. You know what I mean? And also holding space for too. You know, it, what was interesting for me again, kind of going back to everything I just said. You know, I got a lot of pushback because I was always pretty open about my dissatisfaction about whatever, and people often thought that I was really hard on my dad, and I was. And yet there was also this element now here that I can hold both pieces. Mm-hmm. That he did the best that he could, but it also wasn't enough for what I needed for what his children needed, given the traumatic circumstances, it can be both, right? Whereas before it was just the one side, no, this is not enough. And that's not okay. Um, you know, and so it's given me the power to be able to hold both of those pieces. Whereas before it was like, I felt like I had to forfeit any compassion or empathy for myself to be able to say, well, fine, he did the best he could, you know? Yeah. And so that's been kind of, this is a long winded answer to sort of tell you, um, that's been one of the biggest pieces in my grief journey, if you will. Um, right. So I started to really unpack all of it in my early twenties and, and it started out really focusing on my dad, but of course it all shifted over to my mother. And, mm-hmm. um, but it, it, it's interesting because it shifts to somebody, like you saying, somebody that you don't even have a recollection or memory of. Mm-hmm. And you're like, how is the absence of somebody that I don't even remember have such a huge impact on my life? So, right. So you kept on, uh, your dad was the scapegoat to some extent of your relationships and everything that was going on, but it was really the true cause of it was this void of your mom not being there. So that's a like, great way so, to put it. And it's what compounded the trauma, right? Like I don't want to yeah. insinuate to anybody and I, and in no way am I insinuating my, you know, my PTSD is my solely my father's fault. That's not what I'm saying in any way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's important to me to clarify also the, the children can experience these really traumatic experiences and they can still develop healthy, secure attachment and grow up um, uh, to, to yeah, be, you Because know. it's perception. Because everybody's perception and susceptibilities are different. My mom even says that my birth, she would say that I was anxious as a kid because I was born with forceps. So she's like, you had a traumatic mm-hmm. birth. So you are, mm-hmm. you know, the reason you're anxious. So my mom would say that. I'm like, how would I even know? Because I don't even remember, you know? But she would say, I think you're anxious because you had a traumatic birth. Your body so, remembers. Yes. you. That's, yes. That is so true. Wow. Okay. So sorry. I keep on it, but you're saying so many like things that I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry if I'm, you know, interjecting all the time, but it's just like so many like things that I can totally relate to what you're saying. So then you, you end up doing this. How, how many years did you do then therapy then in college and how did that unpacking kind of keep on going and for you to, yeah, find out all these different dynamics and relationships? Yeah. Um, so what's interesting actually is, um, and I I tell this piece because I feel like it's an important part of the story, but so my actual first experience with therapy was fairly traumatic. Um, I, I (laughs) went about like somebody that went through trauma. Yeah. Um, so I did (laughs) go to the call, you know, the center on the college campus and now, you know, years later and, and edu and all the education and whatnot. Now I understand how the system works, which is still not good enough um 
that it was, you know, they were offering short-term counseling. Um, and ultimately, the short version is she basically said, <laughs> you've got all sorts of baggage and we can't help you in the amount of time that we have. So here's a referral list and good luck. But she didn't even like finish the session with me. You know what I mean? It was basically like, oh, so I'm broken. Okay, awesome. If I had the resources as a 20 year old who's supporting myself through mm. school to go pay for a therapist, do you think that I would be here? You know, and so it actually, right. um, and what that did is it sort of solidified this idea of, um, right. I feel like it, when you, when you experience loss as a child, you get all these mixed messages. On one hand, there's this idea that what kids don't know or remember won't hurt them, or they're so resilient oh. or insert all of these, you know, platitudes. Um, and I'm the first to say, I don't, if I'm struggling 36 years later after she died and I don't even remember her. First of all, that's a bunch of bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but also too, it was really this idea of like, that because it was so severe, I didn't deserve, I, I, you couldn't even squeeze in any empathy. Does that make sense? It was like, there, it was too big. Not only mm -hmm. like, was there this side of like, it shouldn't even be a, a a blip on my radar right because i'm so resilient or i don't remember but on the other side then it was also like but it's much too big i can't help you you're so traumatized wow. we can't possibly provide you and the then, resources and then that, that feels so yeah then you feel so help you leave there feeling so helpless like there's like you know and like you're like you you know what i mean like what do you mean <laughs> he's like when somebody tells you that like that like what what do you do with that kind of information when the therapist that person you go to for help gives you that kind of perspective like what did what like like i mean i that it just adds so much more to your emotions yeah. I, I don't even how did you even it how was did you pretty even devastating and it was a total deterrent i did not go back for several more years um and that was basically out of necessity you know i think i had mentioned at the beginning it was sort of like my emotional regulation was just off the charts it was the anger the everything was just sort of mm -hmm. seeping out of me um and what was happening is i was having like really dysregulated uh responses in terms of like a friend of mine would tap me on the back and i turn around and like be ready to slap her you know what i mean like the, the these responses were not matching up with with where i felt inside um and so ultimately it was a, a matter of necessity, but I had also gotten a referral from somebody that I trusted, right? It wasn't sort of just blindly walking oh, into just, yeah. the clinic. Let yeah. me scroll through the little, let me scroll through the roller decks of, of, of therapists and choose. But this time it was somebody that actually referred you yeah. to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I, I think that per, that first piece, um, or that first experience is important. And I tell it because, you know, it was that idea of, um, really changing the way that I look at my grief. Right. And that to me is one of been one of the biggest steps or tools of my journey, if you will, um, that has helped me sort of break out and, um, From the expectations, not only that, you know, you sort of absorb from society and life, but also the, the, the expectations that I was putting on myself, you know, and the grief that, um, or how do I say the sort of, um, letting go of the lies that grief wants you to believe. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and so I feel like I'm jumping ahead all over the place here, but the point it's is, okay. that, um, well, you know what though? That is, that is okay because, uh, is grief linear? No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, true. so it's, oh, right. It does. It goes everywhere. Right. So it's, it's okay. It's okay. If the, if the, if you jump, because that is how it is. So, so then, uh, yeah. Wh what happened then? What was the, go ahead and jump wherever you need to jump into the. Yeah. So my first story. therapist after that <clears throat> negative experience on campus was actually, um, it was very positive and, um, it's important to me to say we did a lot of really good work. Although now again, after all this time and, and going back to school and whatnot, now I recognize she wasn't trauma informed. Right. And so that was a big piece of my grief, right? That, um, it's not just that I grieve or that I've experienced loss. I've experienced traumatic grief. I've experienced traumatic mm -hmm. loss. Um, 
And that doesn't mean it's any more important or any more drastic. It just just means, yeah, yeah, there's all these different different complexities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And layers to sort of look at it through. Um, Because it's also the fear, the fear component of knowing that somebody else can take somebody's life. Just even just that aspect of the, just the, how your mom passed away that in itself creates mistrust. Absolutely. That in itself. Mm-hmm. But can, so it's just, I, I want to, I'm sorry, I want to do this pause. What are your studies in? What did you end up studying? Because you yeah. mentioned a lot of your studies. So what did mm-hmm. you end up studying? Did it have to do, are you studying anything with psychology? Yes. Yeah, so my undergrad was I in communication it. studies and psychology. Uh-huh. And then, I, um, I was working in title and escrow because it was the only thing that I could, uh, that was going to support my education. Um, and so after I graduated, I worked in that industry and then moved on to background screening for about five years. And um, it was kind of coupled with this whole season of digging into therapy and really recognizing that grief was a big part of my life, even though it was, mm-hmm. um, even though it felt like a, a, a new part of my life as an adult. Well, it was a new discovery for you. The fact that that was the cause of so many of the other aspects of your life, that all the, all your life you had been grieving without even knowing. Exactly. And so Mm -hmm. it it was again, sort of back to the stepping stone idea. So anyway, I was working, the industry just wasn't fulfilling my soul, you know, and I always knew Mm -hmm. that I wanted to help people in some way, shape or form. I didn't necessarily know how that would look. So then I decided to go back to school. I thought I was going to be a marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, And while I was in the program, figured out that, again, was not the right fit for me. (laughs) Um, Because, you know, for me personally, I see myself as much more of an advocate or facilitator. Whereas for therapists, you know, one of the main tools is the relationship that you build with each other, right? And that's Mm -hmm. sort of the trauma piece that's really tricky for me. Um, So anyway, I... Um, ended up working in mental health after that. And I loved it. It was the best fit for me. I really felt like I was giving back and using um, not only my skills and my education to be able to give back, but, um, or how do I say this? Um, Even though I wasn't providing direct services, I still felt like the ways that I was supporting the program um, and the services was really it is giving back. It is yeah. giving back. Any, even just the fact of being present in something, even if you're the one like at the reception desk of something like that in, in an environment that supports that, it's still giving back. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So it is, and you wouldn't be at that, at that facility. <laughs> you would have gotten there had you not gone through maybe the life experiences you went. So I, I just, I think it's awesome. Okay. So that, that is awesome. Okay. So so then you did that and then, um, I was laid off, unfortunately, oh, you know, just oh, like going man. back to the system, you know, the funding for yeah. my particular position, it wasn't considered essential moving forward, um, not to use current language, but there we go. <laughs> mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and so all that to say, um, it happened right around the time that our dog had broken his back and had surgery. We had bought our first house, sort of life had kind of exploded a little bit. And so I was in this position of, okay, so how do I find flexibility but also so that I can show up for my family but also be able to support my family? And so ultimately, that was when I opened up my Etsy shop, which is called the Joyful Jewelry Box. And uh, I, and that's what I and that's what attracted me about your your page was I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like so beautiful because it's something that is giving back in that process of of also like grief. So tell me, tell yeah, tell us. Tell us more about that, about your Etsy shop and all these gifts you yeah. have, gifts or tokens or memories. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, what did, tell us. So at the time of everything I just told you about, I reconnected with a local jewelry designer who needed some help. And so that was kind of what got me back into, before that it had always just been a little bit of a hobby um, that I would do with my best friend in college sometimes. And... She showed me the ins and outs, and ultimately it felt like, okay, this is a flexible way to be able to kind of ride this season out. Um, Mm. And so in the beginning, it was mainly just bohemian chic jewelry, whatever I felt like designing. And and I enjoyed it, but again, kind of that piece of my gut was going back to, okay, so where's the soul? What's what? Mm. What are we doing with your life? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, let's get back to the piece of um, bringing all of this full circle. And I always knew that, you know, I wanted 
to honor my mom in some way. Um, and I, I, excuse me, I had already started by honoring my mom with the name. My middle name is Joy. And so that was why um, I named it the Joyful Jewelry Box. And mm -hmm. the background behind that is that when I was born, my family was in <clears throat> apparently a tough season and it was important to my mom that that be my middle name to sort of represent the joy mm -hmm. that is still possible even in the even midst in of hard times. times. Yeah. Oh. And so, um, you know, that was sort of the piece that I was talking about growing up that I felt really resentful. It was sort of like, I would sort of scoff at my middle name, like the idea of that, you want me to be joyful? Like this is no. Um, right. But as I grew up and really started to understand who she was and what was important to her in ways that I could honor her memory, um, I started to really recognize how important and significant that was. And so um, I knew that I wanted to pay homage to her in some way. And so that started with the name. But then as time evolved, it was so fascinating to me that as I thought about it, as I thought about being a kid and, and learning about her and living without her, something that I used to do all the time was play with her jewelry box. Oh I would gosh. dig through it and pick out all the trinkets and all my favorite pieces. And then I would go hide them in all my special little kid hiding spots. And it really was just this little ritual that I had that helped me feel close to her, I think. Right. And so it was fascinating to sort of have all of this come full circle um, after it had already began. Right. Out of necessity, this idea of. Um, I didn't even know that that was my that that was a connection I had to her or her memory. Um, and so once I kind of pieced that all together, it really just, um, fell into place in the way that I just, <laughs> again, that stepping stone again of like every little bit has been leading me to this, at least for this season, you know? Um, and so what I do is I try and now take that concept and, um, infuse those ideas into jewelry so that other people, because a lot of people don't necessarily have um, their mother's jewelry still, uh, or maybe they're mourning, um, you know, they're grieving their father or a male in their life. So there is no jewelry or whatever. So the point is, um, you know, my family symbol for my mom is a dragonfly. So I take all sorts of things like that. Dragonflies, butterflies, sparrows, um, hawks, all those kinds of things. And then I'll pair them with, first stones and initial charms and kind of all of that. So it's like a little, a, a tangible uh, representation of their memory, so to speak. Mm. So I just documented the chills I got. Like I literally, as you're talking, I'm like, okay, let me screenshot my, my goosebumps right now. I just didn't want to interrupt you, but I, because I interrupt so many times anyway. I've already interrupted you so many times in the process. I'm like, no, I no, do no, it no. too. Don't worry about I'm like, it. I'm like biting my tongue. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to tell her I've got goosebumps, but I'm going to hold it. When you talked about the the jewelry box and just the that as a child, that is the connection that you did, but that you actually didn't, that memory didn't come up mm -hmm. till after you had developed your Etsy shop. Like the fact that those memories were there but that that didn't come up to you till after you developed this, like, and this finding that kind of full circle kind of mm -hmm. feeling, oh my gosh, I like literally that just brought me chills. Um, and then the part when you said about dragonflies, I dra so the, um, was it last, I think two years ago, one of my friends said that she had, um, that her spirit animal was, I forget which one was at that moment. I'm like, oh, I don't know what my spirit animal is. I don't know. And, and then all of a sudden I started seeing dragonflies everywhere, everywhere. And I'm like, and I'm like, wait, are they, maybe, maybe it's just the season. No, but then everywhere it was dragonfly mm -hmm. everywhere. So right now when you said dragonflies, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to check out her jewelry oh, to see the it. dragonflies. Oh, I love it. Thank you. So now in this whole journey, because I missed the part I'd never even asked you, like with your, how you, you're now, you know, in a relationship, you have your doc. How, how did that, where did that part of your relationship come in? It, was it after college, during college? Mm -hmm. How was it? So I actually met my husband uh, right when I was graduating college. And the fun part of that is one of my childhood best friends had actually set us up and we didn't even realize that what was, that that was Wait. what was happening. 
Um, oh, wait, wait. Your friend set you up, but you didn't know you guys were being set up? No. So what's cool is that, <laughs> um, like I said, I ended up, you know, moving and growing up into a, a tiny little town. And just mm-hmm. by happenstance, you know, my two best friends from there, we all ended up in the same area. Um, and so while we were living here, the friend that I'm referring to, she was in long distance with somebody still in our hometown. And my husband knew him through all of these random ways. And so her husband was down here visiting her over one college weekend. And they said, hey, we're going to go barbecue. Just come with us. Like as nonchalant as could be, Uh Um, (laughs) which I loved. And what was really cool about it is that he had spent time in my tiny little town. It's called Tuolumne. And uh, so people can barely even pronounce it, let alone have yeah, even like, heard of it. Yeah, like Tuolumne, like yeah, Tuala, so, Tuala, yeah. Tuala, like, <laughs> but it's with a T, Tuolumne. Yeah, so it's a Native yeah, American okay. name and uh, the Miwok uh, tribe. It's T-U-O-L-U-M-N-E. Um, so it's, the Miwok you know, tribe what was in Cal- is that the tribe that was in that part of California? Yeah, so just up the okay. hill from our okay. little area, if or where okay. my house was, if you will. There's a little. Um, has so they're still call this? it a town yeah mm-hmm. okay um, good. called Miwok and so and, and in fact that's not the only tribe but the point is it's a Native American name mm-hmm. and it was just people don't know about it let alone have they been there <laughs> so mm-hmm. that was really neat and um the short version is we really hit it off and what's been interesting too kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation I feel like this is always an interesting part um when I tell my story You know, in terms of like the relational trauma, I imagine that people probably think that that means that (laughs) my marriage is just a hot mess or that I'm... No, no, no. no. That's actually, that's part of the reason, (sighs) that's part of the reason I was going to ask because then it's like, you don't even know what the, what the, what it would look like to even see that type of relationship because you didn't, you grew up with your dad seeing him marry somebody else and then another, you know what I mean? It's that. So that's why I was even curious. So yeah. So Tell us what that, what, what that well, means. And the I would say, um, I would say certainly my experience, you know, kind of entrenched in me the idea that I really wanted that not to be my story. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and you know, again, you only have so much control, so I'm not trying to imply that, that, you know, my, <laughs> this was ever anything that my dad wanted. Um, right, right. but it was important to me to really be, um, that my marriage was going to be a really positive part of my life. Um, And it's fascinating. Certainly there's, you know, some challenges that we have because of my attachment trauma, but I notice it more in my friendships and my other relationships than I do with Mm -hmm. us. Um, Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think a big piece of that is um, I didn't do a lot of dating before him. Um, I had one other serious relationship and it was a positive experience, but it also was, um, you know, I had enough awareness to know that, what word do I want to use? But the on, life experiences the that I carry. <laughs> yeah, right. I was yeah. like, I, I don't want to want to imply baggage or issues in no way, shape, or form. I know so it's so. Are- Words are so, they carry so much meaning and it's so interesting how just even picking a word that it sometimes you're like, wait, if I say this word, are people going to think of it as a certain, because then we, you know what I mean? It's interesting, like how we have to think so much about Mm -hmm. what words we choose just to simplify, you know, just to explain something. Mm -hmm. So you did, yeah. So then. It's important to me because I think, especially with grief, we've, you know, internalized so much, Mm -hmm. so much reasoning and um, platitudes and explanations that like, it's really important to me to sort of articulate when I'm explaining my experience, what my experience is, isn't, doesn't mean that that's what it has to be for everybody. It, no. And that is, that, it's going and that is the, yeah, that was your story. And that's a thing. And something that is so to, you know, in relation to this podcast is that is the whole reason I do these interviews because every single person that I've interviewed has had a completely different mm-hmm. journey in yeah. their grief. So there, that's why there can't be really a manual. And honestly, there can't really be exactly certain steps because how could there be Seriously. a particular diagram when we're just so unique, each individual and how everything happens. Okay. So then, okay. So back, so then with this, with the, you were said, you didn't want to use the word baggage. Yeah. Back to that I just part. think that I've recognized that the, my life's experiences, yes. the weight of them, he was yeah. not able to carry that and share that with me. Mm. Um, and I just was grateful that I 
had enough awareness, right? Um, for lack of a better term, but I, I think that that was also out of protection because of what I said before that, that I was determined that I was not going to end up in a similar dysfunctional situation, right? And again, mm-hmm. that's not necessarily practical. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody knew my mother was going to be murdered, right? And so right, there's right, an right. element right. of like just, you know, taking control of life and gripping right. it. And that's not always necessarily wise. But I appreciate that I, ha- I knew yeah. enough to know that my partner was going to have to carry this with me and that, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that, or not carry it with me, but that was. <laughs> You know, like I Compa- hear about so many relationships. It was going to be compassionate, compassionate about your experience. That yeah. Was be, that was, so, yeah many, that was, mm-hmm. so many people don't experience grief before marriage. Um, and then you hear about one partner there, you know, a parent has, <coughs> excuse me, they've lost a parent or they've lost a, whoever, someone significant in their life and their partner doesn't get it. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. they haven't been through it. And and the additional rifts that that can create on top of, I mean, we already know, and we've talked about a little bit, but how much relationships change and um, after loss and because of grief and whatnot. And that's challenging in and of itself. Um, and so that was just not something that I wanted to take on. I was not going to be arguing about my grief with my significant other. Does that make sense? Like yeah, it was a yes, non-negotiable but, for me. <laughs> right. Why would you have to defend yourself the yeah. way you feel or explain yourself of like, today I want to stay in bed or today yeah. I want, you know, like when somebody wouldn't comprehend. Yeah. Um, that is that. So then how then you, when you met then your husband at this barbecue, then how was that then your now husband? How was that different? How did you know that he would be somebody that would be able to accompany you in Mm -hmm. this journey of living with grief um you know this is sort of a funny example because it's not related to grief at all and it's also interesting because I think that when we met that was I was still just starting to crack it open a little bit but Mm -hmm. um he is older than me he's nine years older than me and so it was interesting because I was 22 right so I was very used to um you know younger men who were not talking or thinking about commitment or marriage or family or any of that. And, um, as we were getting to know each other and I was making remarks about, um, whether or not I wanted to have children or sort of who I saw myself as in the future. I remember one day he, um, he came over on his lunch break and wanted to have a conversation about these things. And I was just floored. (laughs) (laughs) um because you know again if we're going to generalize um I try not to do that very much but sort of you know in your early 20s in college typically girls are the one women are the people thinking about those things and prioritizing those things and generally speaking men are not you know and so um it just spoke to me on a level of like, okay, well, not only are you different, like you're really, you're really into this, but you're also somebody who's looking for commitment. You know what I mean? That mm-hmm. you are broaching these conversations with me, that you want to know what you can expect from me, right? Sort of that reciprocal, not even just reciprocal, but um, that he went out on a limb and sort of started that work. It showed to me like an emotional maturity and, oh. Um, uh, that yeah, is a good yeah. point. Yeah, because that means that yeah, with the whole thing with emotional intelligence and things like that, like that are yeah. So that emotional maturity allowed you to know that he'd be somebody that would be able to comprehend to some level, even if he had not lived the type of grief you had, would be able to be compassionate in your journey because of those things you the little signs you started seeing this is good this is a good you know you said you didn't want to go into family and marriage there you know <laughs> uh, but that's a good tip for anybody th- looking for a partner like the in term you know what I mean a lifelong yes. partner look into yes. these little signs of things that you see that may not necessarily be completely related to what you're going through but that you see that yeah like that they'd be able to be a good good fit and com- yeah that companion yeah. That's or awesome. even, uh, I appreciate you um, 
I appreciate that that stands out to you because that is something I did realize that a few years ago and I was like, <laughs> that, that to me is actually, but um, not that I'm so wise, but that that's a unique part of my experience that not a lot of people have, yeah. right? Yeah. That, you know, as yeah. when you experience loss as children, that you none carry that into the relationship as opposed to experience it together on the other side. Um, yeah. You know, and I think too, there just was an element of knowing that, uh, or not knowing, but no, <laughs> you know, that gut piece to me, my, I, I really try and rely on my instinct, um, as much as, as much as possible. And there just was an element of like, <clears throat> uh, adaptability with me or, um, I don't know how to, how am I trying to articulate this? That he was willing to learn from my experience, I guess, right? Mm. In the way of like, that he well, now- what if he was curious? He was curious, even just the element of curiosity, of wanting to get to know your story instead of being scared of something he did not know and or did not even know how he'd face. Yeah, actually, that's a really good way to put it. Um, but also, too, like, I don't know that a lot of what I practice or believe now was conscious before, right? That I think that I slowly over time as I grew up and figured out, well, that doesn't fit. Well, this doesn't fit. Well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, that's not my experience. You know, kind of all of those things. Once I started to really grow up and say there is no right way to grieve. There is no timeline to grieve. There is yeah. no um, kind of all of these different ideas. Um, there was an element that I knew that he was open to that, right? That he didn't feel like he knew the whole world, that he trusted my experience and, and wanted to support it for me, however I articulated it or however it was showing up in that season. Um, so I don't even really know that I'm answering the question other than to say that there was a willingness <laughs> to sort of walk, to like figure it out with me. Right. Because I yes. still don't necessarily know <laughs> what's going to work or what's not going to work. Sometimes the things that do work, they don't work on this day. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, milestones are horrible. And other times you're like, what's the big deal? You know, yeah, yeah, so yeah. there was a willingness <laughs> to sort of like, that is so, that is so awesome. You're so, that is so true. It's like, Oh, birthday. Oh, it was her birthday. Yeah. It was her anniversary yesterday. Oh, I didn't even notice this year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or while other years you'd be like, you know, that, that is so, Oh my gosh, you're just saying so many things that I can relate to that I hope that others listening resonate with what you're saying as much as I am because I'm totally right there with you, girl. I totally Thank can relate. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad. I'm glad too, especially since we didn't do like the, you know, the, the, the intro call. I was like, I got to make sure I get the... <laughs> <laughs> give up some good no, nuggets <laughs> I, well i love these nuggets i love them that's awesome so how many years have you guys been married so we just had our ninth anniversary in may oh. and we have yeah and we have been together uh 14 years wow and then you yeah. have a dog you said one dog one dog yeah and he's just one and he's very much our it, special little guy. I mean, I know that you said everybody loves their surgery. animals, but we're those suckers who he is our kid. Yeah, it, so, <laughs> is, yeah, no, no, no. I and actually one of one of the story, one of the journeys I share. One of my friends, the first grief experience she had had was her dog, who she'd had had for like seventeen years, and it was the it was the person, it the person, it was that special, Ugh. you know. Yeah, I want to say person, but <laughs> you see, I, now I'm the one searching for words. It was her special someone who had been with her for all her milestones. So yeah. that grief experience to her was hard. So I, I can know how, when a, when a dog is, you know, that, that, you know, close to you. So is this the dog you mentioned earlier about having back surgery or something like that? Is this yeah. So he had a, for lack of a better term, a, a bone spur that ruptured. And so literally we woke up one morning and he was paralyzed. And uh, so we rushed okay. him into emergency surgery and, um, that we didn't actually know if it would work. Thankfully it did. Um, but it was just, you know, for the first year after that we had to, I mean, he needed 24 seven care and we had to help him learn how to walk and go to the bathroom again and kind of all those things. So not only is he, you know, our kid, but then having sort of this really intense experience with him, um, just 
added to it. So when you talk about, you know, the, your other guests, I just, ah, mm-hmm. uh, when people and pet loss, I just, even though I'm not, um, there yet with him, I've experienced it before and, and I know it's going to be yeah, a whole no, nother level. You went and you went through the the worry of when you went through that surgery. You know what I mean? You went through the worries. It's still it, it, that's a it, you know what I mean. You've already gone through the 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 stress of yeah of seeing your dog be in pain and go through that. So no, I I I, I, I told my husband. The other day, I was hugging my dog. She's three years old. And I was just kissing her. And I told Carlos, I'm like, there's some days that I just like think of like, I don't even know what I'm going to do when she like the thought of her not being around. And my husband then says, I know a good podcast about (laughs) grief. Damn it. Yes, Carlos. <laughs> it was Although so I'm not hosting that episode. <laughs> it was so funny because um I it was because it's true. Like it's like sometimes even just that that fear of you know how sometimes we like fear like mm, how do I say this? That okay, like sometimes I've heard of people, for example not wanting to get attached to something, knowing that they may lose it, right? Mm -hmm. So we end up like missing out on certain things or experiences or relationships or anything because we know that there is an element of that knowing that that is not always going to be there. Mm -hmm. And, um, And making our decisions in life based on that fear of something that we know is inevitable, um, and that happens to everybody in this case, let's say the aspect of death, just if we were not to live our lives and create the relationships that we do just because we were fearful of the knowing what life would look like after we've loved so hard something Mm -hmm. to then not have them present in our life, then what would be the point of life? And, um, and so as, hard, you know, and even though these thoughts of the me hugging my dog and knowing this and because I've already felt what grief looks like and to know that eventually I will feel it, it doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't make me any less, I, I mean, I do, I'm not a grief expert, you know what I mean? Just because I've gone through, it doesn't mean that I could just suddenly, oh, the next time I go through that, I'm just going to cruise on through. No, because every time I've experienced grief, you know, it's still a different journey. You know what I mean? You still have to go through it. It's still, it's still there. So, you know, um, that's, you just nailed something really important in the way of, um, because you said that, you know, um, that you're not a grief expert. And I, my rebuttal was to say, but you are an expert on your own experience. And we are. are. And yet, but you just made a great point in the sense of we can only be so much of an expert, even of our own experience, because who knows what it's going to look like when it comes back, Mm -hmm. right? Because we will change. So Mm -hmm. all I tell people in that journey of even grief, like, for example, I tell people grief doesn't go away. We just, I mean, and I'm saying, okay, let me, I'll rephrase that. Grief when it comes to do is, especially when it has to do with some, with death, um, definitely does not go away. It just changes. It transforms because we grow. And so that the, the lapses between maybe times in which it was really tough or the times in which we don't want to get out of bed or things like that, maybe longer, you know, like, oh, wow, I actually, like you said, like, oh, wait, I forgot even today was a big milestone. I didn't even remember, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but, um, and again, it comes in and, in and out of waves. But then also because we start changing, we never know what other aspects of even ourselves may change that when we experience life again, and again, the dynamics of the the next loss or whatever are going to be different than whatever other, I don't like to use the word loss and I just did, but the, the next death or, you know, grief experience you go through, we will be a different person. The dynamic with the other, with that person would be different. So therefore how we, how we respond to that will be different. So I never Mm -hmm. tell somebody, even though I have had my sister pass away, I've had my mom pass away. I cannot tell you, I understand you. I can't Mm -hmm. tell you that because I am not you. I can only say I can relate to part of your story because I've gone through it myself. I've gone through a grief experience. So I have that relate. I can relate to it. I can't tell you that I know what you are going through because I'm not you. 
Mm-hmm. And, and therefore, I am not me myself either when I experience it again later on, because I'll be a different version of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I can't guarantee that I'll navigate through the next journey either. I hope I do <laughs> in some way or another, but we, it doesn't guarantee it. So actually live, talking about that, then have you experienced since your mom's death, then have you experienced death again in any other aspects of, um, of your life that you've had to then deal with grief? You know, I have, and yet not to that degree um, by any means. You know, my grandparents were young, excuse me, I was young when all of my grandparents passed away. Um, And it's interesting because I'm finding myself sort of comparing in my mind, which I don't like to do in any way. I know because it's so different. Right, Um, right, right. But it's but it's how our how our mind works, I think. We sometimes just do that. Yeah. Um, it's more the level of understanding, I would say. Um, I have not experienced significant um grief from death, if you will, Mm -hmm. since I have started navigating this work more deeply. Right. So there's pieces of my life where I have, but it still didn't quite. And I don't like to use this word, but that, whatever, um, for lack of a better one is what I mean. Um, it didn't compare to my mom. Right. I already mm. knew the worst pain. So like to, to have something else be to that level again will have to be in my in my mind, you know, my my husband, my sister, my dog. Um mm relationships of those nature of that kind of nature um and yet it's funny because we literally just talked about this and this was sort of in the back of my mind and it's interesting because I don't talk about it very much and I hate to create the idea that compares to my dog but uh (laughs) right when I was meeting Brandon um my childhood cat had passed away. And that was kind of a whole thing. I'll spare you all the details, but, um, my senior year of high school, the house had burned down. And so he ended up moving to college. Yeah. Oh, you've been through (laughs) that. That is grief and accept that right there is a huge major grief experience as well. Actually, Yes, it was. In fact, I feel sort of, um, silly that I, that I don't, but I don't naturally it? think about, well, I do, but I don't naturally go there, right? Because I think I said earlier, it's because I compartmentalize so much, yes. right? It was the day before my high school, my senior year of high school Ooh. started. And um, I ended up living with um, extended family for the year. And it's so funny, like now as an adult, looking back, you're just like, what? I still ended up, I still worked that entire year. I still got straight A's. Like, it's unreal. That's- um, that, that said, that, doesn't that, do you like go back and be like, go Lindsay? Like, do you go back and like, be like that so proud of the teenage version of you I that do. went through all yes. that and still like, wow. I wow. do. And then there's also the piece of me and this isn't a, this, you know, I, I don't want to butcher the phrase, but you know, something about of, um, forgive yourself for how you survived when you didn't know better. Right. So at the time, ultimately I just ran around just trying to make myself valuable to anybody and everybody and just achieve and just, right. I, I actually sort Living of, um, yourself. yeah. Found like trying to, my like, identity find... in that resilience, if you will. Mm. And, and I don't, and I still do to some degree, although now it's a lot more realistic. <laughs> I think and before it was like, I don't, yeah, it was very yeah, much the like, yeah. I'm so like strong. What a mom would feel do. sorry yeah. for me. Yeah. Right. Um, Whereas now it's both pieces. It's yes, I can do all of these things. And yet it still doesn't erase the fact that I'm living with a lot of pain. Yes. And that it's okay. And that there is still, there's still strength in showing those vulnerable parts of you and the part, the, the parts that are hurting, that there's still strength in that and resilience, even if you show those sides of you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that is that is it. So you went back to okay. So the the cat. Sorry, I because I interrupted when you're like my house burned down. Like what? Wait, wait, wait. No, I know it's oh, fine. No worries. See, and it's, it's funny. You can sort of see the compartmentalization <laughs> even just in how I've <laughs> handled this yeah, conversation. <laughs> that is huge. That's a huge thing it is to go huge. through. Um, yeah. And what was sad so it about was. it was besides the fact that you know I was lost our family home and displaced from my dad, but. Um, 
you know, we lost all my mom's belongings, right? So it felt like another punch in the gut in the okay. sense of like okay. the Good connections that we, yeah, the connections we had to her mm. were gone. And so that was, mm. that was a big, um, that was a big Pictures, piece of it. Yeah. Pictures, everything. Yeah. yeah in was... my baby book. Yeah. Um, oh, and so I'm... thank you. That was, that's me. I mean, of course, anything with her is irreplaceable, but that is irreplaceable, right? Yeah, because she, yeah, she no, was no, the voice can't... of that experience of that season of my life. Yeah. And then now even that's yeah. gone. Um, but so after that, the cat ended up moving to college with me. He was great. I loved him. His name was Snickers. And um, mm-hmm. he ended up towards the end of his life returning home to live on the property with my dad. And I still remember I was getting on the freeway after work, driving to Brandon's house. And my dad told me on the phone and kind of just off the cuff. <laughs> like nonchalant? Kind of. <laughs> and uh, probably just didn't know how to break it to you. So it was like, I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I just, that, I remember that being really significant for, I mean, not only because he was my animal and, um, that that was the closest kind of death besides grandparents, um, you know, since my mom and what was interesting at the time was again, because I didn't understand how, how much grief I carried and how that would impact me. Um, I was devastated that week like called and sick to work like just not well you would have thought a human had died and I remember my boss at the time and this was such an interesting added layer but she her animals her cats were her kids too like they were very important to her and I remember her being so annoyed with me so annoyed that I didn't like just suck it up and I was like I don't why don't you get it? I don't, why don't you get it? Really? Wait, wait, yeah, wait. And this it was, is somebody else. Wait, I thought that you were going to say completely the opposite when you yeah, said know, she right? also, that her animals were also like her baby. Mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be completely opposite. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, that I mean, was we never be, had a conversation you know, about it. Interesting. I'm sorry, what? Huh. what no, no, I thought she was going to be empathetic. Yeah. No, I and thought that, she was going to be empathetic. <laughs> I did too. And, um, and we never had a, a direct conversation where she was like, you shouldn't feel this way, but it was sort of implied. And, uh, and so it was very significant in terms of um, being aware of what other people thought of grief or other mm-hmm. people's, right? Because at least with my mom, um, and I'm so sorry for anybody in your audience where this isn't the case, because generally speaking, people have not said, um, terrible things to me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that they do to a lot of other grievers, but generally Mm -hmm. speaking, I think the nature of my mother's death, um, there really was no way to sort of compartmentalize or create any pleasantries or platitudes out of that per se. Like Uh, the being they at least the, that they wouldn't do that at least start their sentences with at least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) But I definitely felt that in this other experience. Right. Mm. Um, and so it just was, a. it was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was eye opening. It was really eye opening in terms of mm, my understanding of what adults really thought of grief outside of my really extreme example, (laughs) my really extreme experience where you'd have to be like the biggest asshole to try and like (laughs) create some meaning out of it, you know? (laughs) Um, so anyway, that was sort of a long ramble. Yes. Actually I've had a lot of other, um, grief related experiences. Yes. Um, Huge ones. Huge ones. And that's the thing. A lot of times then we, like you were saying, that not only compartmentalize, but then we end up minimizing some mm-hmm. of these experiences because this other one is so big that then yeah. we end up even minimizing them in our in our journey. While at the same time, mm-hmm. they may actually play an even bigger part in, or in some ways uh, in the story of our life and what direction our life ends up, you know, taking us. Mm-hmm. Um 
So we don't, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, we don't even, we don't know what each of these things, you know, takes to, yeah, what, what it need, why it's there and what growth we need to go, you know, go through and why we're experiencing it. But for you then, all these things have built you up to now be somebody who not only has this space, then an Etsy, which I'm going to get your, your, I don't know, the website and be able to put it in the show notes so people know mm -hmm. where to go. Uh, what other things do you have in your jewelry, in the joyful jewelry? Am I saying right? Joyful jewelry? Box, yes. Mm -hmm. Box jewelry. The joyful what other things box. do you have on, in, your, so, in your shop? Yeah, so it's <clears throat> it started out as jewelry and then I <clears throat> expanded into keepsakes as well. So I have a lot of inspirational and motivational keychains and whatnot. Um, but then I also have some apparel too, which is pretty cool. I, um, I have hats that are embroidered with the word joy, but that was actually in my mom's handwriting. So that's really cool. Not oh. only is it sort of like full circle of the message, um, but yeah. literally full circle of her message, you know, and her memory out in the world. Um, and then I also have started to slowly branch out into grief resources as well. So, um, perfect. So I, any book, so when people go to your website, they would see then what kind of resources are available because you've probably, of course, in your time, especially from college years till now, when you started basically doing all the, your grief, you know, therapy and support, you've used a lot of grief, you know, grief resources. So what kind of resources do you have then on your, on your website that people yeah, would so be able to find? It's sort of uh, two prongs, if you will. The primary thing that I look at it is that I provide online grief support through my Instagram um, in the way of um, really just trying to create a safe space and community for individuals to be able to um, have that support and that connection even outside of products or my shop or whatever, but really to be able to... Um, change the way they think about grief, right? And challenge mm -hmm. the ideas that they've learned out there in the world. So that's sort of one primary resource is that I really, a lot of my content, not a lot, all of my content is really trying <laughs> to facilitate these, um, these hard and honest conversations. Yes. Um, but yes. also what I've done is that I've really taken, <clears throat> or what I feel that is different in my approach, you know, um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of, new grief experts and advocates out there who are doing what, incredible things. But what was important for me that changed so much was really just changing what I believed about grief. And I think I talked about that a little bit earlier, but this idea that it really doesn't matter what the world thinks. I know that my grief matters. I know that there's no timeline on it. I know um, that there's no wrong way to greet. You know what I mean? Those kinds yes, of ideas. Yes, and so what I yes. did is I, um, without even really recognizing it, these are just little things that I would just internalize and really just build these messages up in my mind over the years as I encountered things that I thought were just junk. <laughs> um, no, and so then I took all of that, that and wrote an affirmation deck. And so what I love about that is um, all sorts of things. It's been, it's, been such a crucial tool in really sort of creating that accountability in terms of changing your thoughts, right? Without yes. getting that out on paper or sort of looking at it. Um, Affirmations are huge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can just sort of, it, it can, it, it can be hard to sort of understand what the reframe is or to sort of untangle all mm -hmm. of those thoughts. So what's really cool is that we take um, a lot of these different um, concepts and, um, not only are they true in and of themselves, but then on the back of the cards, what's incredible is that we've taken the different lines that we often hear from the world or even of our own um, criticism of our own grief, right? This idea that I should be over it by now, that I'm broken, that I'm mm. stuck, that um, that I'm defined by my grief. Move all on. of these, different, yeah, all these ideas. So what we did. Um, because this was a collaboration project, I should say, with um, Abundant Affirmations. She already um, had her business. I had this idea and said, I want to write this deck. Will you help me? So it was a joint project. Um, but what's cool is so you've got the affirmations on the front, but then on the back, you've got that lie or these negative beliefs um, written out so that you can literally and intentionally reframe it with the idea on the front, right? So it's not yes. just refuting the idea that 
um, there's no, uh, or that I should be over it by now. No, mm-hmm. it's not only not that, but there is no timeline, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And so it's really solidifying this idea of um, giving myself and helping others give themselves more grace, space, compassion, truth, permission um, to really just let their journey be what it is, right? Because so often we jump in and we just judge all over ourselves um, and it just is not effective. <laughs> that 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 judgment component that you just said, it is, it is so true because we judge others way of grieving. Like the person that was judging how you were grieving over your cat, mm-hmm. just because her experience or she would think, I don't know. Cause she maybe her, her, her pets were still alive. So she didn't know what it looked like. So mm-hmm. she was judging you by how you were doing it. But then we then sometimes end up questioning we're like, wait, am I doing this exactly. right? Like, is this okay? Mm-hmm. And and then doubting that the way that we're grieving is okay or not. Like me not deleting my mom's phone number from my phone and then judging mm-hmm. myself, with, you know, like it, that it took me two years to do that. But you know what? I'm like, no, but I'm not, I'm not ready. It's okay. You know, while somebody else could be like, what? She hasn't really, you know what I mean? Things, things like that, that is just, it's just out of the gut. Everything you said, it's so interesting because like you said, being part of this community of, people that talk about the subject of grief. I hear when I was starting this, I thought it was like this new con. I mean, literally I just started this podcast and, but you know, just in (laughs) just this year, but um, last year when I started the aspect of grief facilitating and grief coaching, like it, I thought that the way that I thought about grief was unique as well, because Mm -hmm. I because the things I would read didn't necessarily match what I felt like the whole thing of the timeline or, Mm -hmm. or the order or things I'm like, but I don't. So I honestly don't read that many books about grief, uh, Mm -hmm. about the actual psychology around it, because they don't make sense to me now, personally, to my experience. And so to hear that you that as you're saying it yourself, that that it's like that we have similar, you know, ways of seeing that. And every time I talk to people, they feel the same. I'm like, wait, then who's the one writing these theories? I know, right? (laughs) Oh my gosh, so true. Then who's writing the theories? Because if, if a lot of the people I've talked to that have gone through grief don't necessarily see it, that there's an order or something, then why are we still following a particular order? order or thinking that it has to fall into a particular category or I don't know. It's like, I'm just quite, I'm just wondering. Oh yes. No, I've gone there. I've gone down that road and you know, please anybody come argue with me, but, um, oh, or not even argue or, but with us, with us get, because I'm, I'm with you there. We're, they'd have to come and argue with us about this subject then. Yeah. Um, one idea I did have, um, when I was writing my thesis because so, um, Oh, you wrote it about, did you write it about grief? I did. Yeah. So it's called the forgotten mourners traumatic loss during infancy. And so it's much Mm. more now, again, it was, um, but now I understand, of course, the, the, the lens is grief and death and whatnot, but much more, um, the attachment piece of it and how that fits Mm -hmm. into everything. Um, but for a couple of reasons, I mean, I was just sort of tiptoeing into that and a lot of research, obviously, we've just made so many strides with trauma in the last few years, in the last decade, really. Um, but so I did a big analysis of Kubler-Ross and, and ultimately, and you probably know this, so I'm not trying to be redundant to you, but for your audience, you know, her, her theory was developed around terminal patients, right? And, um, and ultimately, it, it sort of broke out from there, and the world got a hold of it. And here we are, decades later. And my mm-hmm. sort of opinion about why even though because there are other grief theories, there have been plenty of other people who followed suit. And we continue. <laughs> we continue yep. to latch onto her to theory, back, like, like, yeah, like it, no other. And, and what I, you just you just said the word latch, and Zoda, it's as if we cannot move on from ideas, and even just going to even what we're going through in this world right now, <laughs> in mm-hmm. this moment in 
2020 of some of some of the attachments that we have to certain things of how things were done and we're still not able to like release that sorry yes. it just right now that you said latch we just have this tendency of just attaching okay yes. so then in your in your thesis then you're like basically like why if all these other things have come up do we still go back to the original quote unquote way in which it was presented Yes. And so actually I didn't write about that part, but I wish that I had now oh. because <laughs> it just feels like it gives Go us back. a sense of control. Go back to school and write it again. I know, Go back right? and do it again. Well, but you know, it'll, it'll be in my book someday. But, um, oh, but this idea yeah, so. that I feel like what it does, it takes this really ambiguous, scary, yes, dark, never ending hole for lack of better term, you know, um, I, I think that I don't know what it's like to think about death without knowing it. So, I mean, mm -hmm, forgive my mm -hmm. assumptions there, but um, I think it gives an idea of control. It gives an idea of mm. um, compartmentalization. It creates organization. It takes all those scary, messy feelings that we have no idea what we're going to do with and all the uncertainty about, wait, what? I'm going to have to live without my person? Mm. And it gives them some sense of control and understanding. So that aspect of control, that is huge because we're, it's basically you're, you're ba it's basically implementing a manual of control for something that you live that you had no control over. Yeah. That you is know, basically what of, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think there's an element too, not to get all political but life is political you know i think there's a function of mm -hmm. um patriarchy too you know you pull yourself mm -hmm. up by your bootstraps and move on and mm -hmm. stuff it down and right and so i think mm -hmm. it creates it sort of facilitates all of those pieces especially too because that was a big you know the, the i might be wrecking the calendar a little bit but in terms of kubler ross's research and um war veterans coming back and um, I feel like that's somewhere within the realm of the same season um, or decade, you know? And so. Oh, and you know, more th I'm, I've never read any of the books about that. So I'm like, I just know the, the, the whole steps of grief, but I've never even, I don't even know the time period. So you've, you've educated me on even the time frame in which it was even, you know, that that theory or the steps were even created. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. 70s but, uh, and 80s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. And there's a lot of things that we even go back to even further, you know, in life, uh, you know, like how, like in psychology, you know, Freud or this, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How many times did people not go refer to things that were studied so long ago and science is current, always evolving. Right. And so it's like all those, some of the things that we end up still studying are things that are theories that probably don't even relate to even the now, but, um, but anyway, they're just the basis of, of learning. But, um, I appreciate so much all the, everything that you've taught. And I could probably go on here another hour chatting about this. Too. Subject. I'm so I'm, sorry. <laughs> it, oh no. Oh no, no. I, I am, it's just something I'm just so fascinating, fascinated of talking and discovering all these different ways of people you know, de you know, dealing with their grief, being able to not dealing, that sounds kind of a, uh, but you know what I mean? How they navigate yeah. their grief and also just the way that they then use that for the good of others. And the fact that you've created these platforms, not only your Etsy shop, but then the Instagram, you know, your Instagram account, which by the way, you, again, like how I, the stories I've seen and how you just show up. So I, I really just so vulnerably and allowing to show the different layers of that emotion. I just think it's so important because it just gives that relatability to somebody else that may be experiencing and feeling like, Oh my gosh, it's okay for me to feel this way. And that is just, I think that that is, probably one of the biggest um, gifts we can give back as somebody that's gone through grief is just allowing uh, our grief to show sometimes <laughs> allowing mm -hmm. it to show so that others that are experiencing it can be like, Oh, okay. I don't have to put it all together and keep it all together. It's okay for me to fall apart once in a while and still have a successful life. Yes. And I, I is just, a, I appreciate that so much. So thank you for showing up in, in the world that way and for bringing these, you know, the different platforms that you provide and, I'm excited for our listeners to be able to go on and check it out and, 
and see all the different resources that they could use in their own grief and maybe also as gifts for somebody else. You know, sometimes people don't know what to give somebody else that mm -hmm. has gone, gone through a grief experience. So these affirmation cards or things like that, it's just a way of you showing somebody that you were thinking of them in that process of their grief journey. So thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, Absolutely. for everything. Thank you, Kendra. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I would do too. Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me if you would rate and comment on this episode. And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.